In the year 70 AD, Roman legions sacked and burned Jerusalem. Israel would remain a nation in exile for nearly 2,000 years. But in the aftermath of World War II, the people of the book returned home. Israel's rebirth and survival in the 20th century has often been called a miracle. Those who were there cite their own experiences as proof. I'm Michael Greenspan. I'm an investigative journalist. These are their stories. Some days my search for miracles in Israel feels more like a search for truth itself. What one man sees as just great luck, another man sees as nothing short of a miracle from God. Who's right? Perhaps it's like one historian told me, that God usually performs miracles in such a way that you can choose to believe or not. But some stories step outside the realm of good luck. You either have to believe or you don't. There's no middle ground. I'm meeting a former army commander in Jerusalem today with such a story from the Six Day War in 1967. Six-day war fought and won in just six days has been called by some a true miracle. At the same time, others insist it was a consummate demonstration of planning, preparation, and battlefield courage. Whatever your position on miracles, it was certainly against all odds. Eight years after the war for independence, Israel had again faced its neighbors in war in the Sinai and won. Ten years had passed since the 1956 war, when storm clouds again began rolling across the desert. Throughout 1966, Jordan and Syria escalated attacks across their borders with Israel. Then on May 15, 1967, Egyptian forces moved into the Sinai. Three days later, Egypt expelled UN peacekeeping forces from Israel's borders. Four days after that, the Straits of Tehran were blocked from Israeli shipping. Three days later, on the 25th of May, the armies of Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia moved their troops to the borders of Israel. Egypt's President Nasser declared, our basic goal is the destruction of Israel. To carry out that threat, the combined arsenals of the six attacking armies amounted to more than half a million trained soldiers, over 3,000 tanks, and nearly 1,000 jet planes armed for attacking the Jewish state. With no attempt made to either hide their presence or their intentions, in the opinion of many, Israel seemed doomed even before the first shot was fired. But secretly, Prime Minister Levi Eshkol and his government agreed that only a preemptive strike could prevent a wholesale annihilation of the Jewish state. On June 5, 1967, the Israeli Air Force launched a bombardment of Egyptian airfields. day's end, 298 Egyptian planes had been destroyed. Prime Minister Eshkol appealed to King Hussein to keep Jordan out of the war. He responded with an artillery barrage against Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. A 
Among those determined to liberate Jerusalem for Israel's Jews was a young battle commander named David Yaniv. David, what were you doing here back in 1967? We came in here to find another route to come into the old city where we can use tanks. Uh, because most of the operation was done by footwork, you know, the paratroopers and so on. And we were finding, trying to find a way where we can come in with tanks just in case. The scouting we did on the French Hill, uh, looking down, uh, because the roads were wider there, so tanks could come through. Uh, of course, until the old city, that's when they narrowed again. Hey, <laughs> 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 תצמדו לקרקע כמה שאפשר, אולי הם לא הבחינו בנו. אין לנו ברירה. נקבל לנו תחמושת. אפילו אם הייתה לנו, זה לא היה משנה כלום. לא יהיה להם שום בעיה להשתלט עלינו ולקחת את כל הצילומים והרשימות. ליאור. כן. יש עליך רימון בחגור? כן. אם הם יתקרבו, תשתמש בו ותוודא השמדת המצלמה וכל החומר שאספנו. קיבלתי. יצחק, קיבלת? קיבלתי. قد رصدنا وما آخر مرة على التلة يراقب ذلك المكان سيدي إني أراه When they came to about, I would say about 200 meters, roughly, towards us, the next thing they stopped and you could see there was this panic. And they started to shout Abu Ibrahim, Abu Ibrahim, which in Arabic means Father Abraham. To us it didn't mean a thing. We thought it must probably be another Arab who came from the other side by the name of Ibrahim, which is a very common name. Bukhim, wait a minute. That really was unexplainable. But there was one Jordanian that was caught from that group. سأقول لكم الحقيقة لقد رأيت إبراهيم ومن ورائه الملائكة تحاملين سيوفا كبيرة. Firstly, we found ourselves outnumbered. Now they found themselves outnumbered themselves, and they just they just ran away. When the interrogators heard the story, and when you heard it afterwards, weren't you a bit surprised? It sounds kind of unusual. I was a complete atheist. So I didn't look at it from a religious point of view or anything. I didn't even look at it as a miracle. I just looked at it as a thing, you know, I, I was happy I was alive. It was later on, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that that was divine intervention. How did other people react when you told them the story that you had actually <laughs> witnessed a miracle, as it were? Well, you must remember, people who are not religious, and the Israeli society as a whole is a secular society. It's only a small percentage who are religious. And when you tell them the story, they said, yeah, 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 you know, you can tell this to the Marines. But the more you thought about it, and the more you told people what you experienced, I myself realized that I literally lived a miracle. How do you tell the difference between 
acts of human endeavor and miracles. How do you define that term, miracle? If you believe, then there is nothing to define. If you trust and believe that there is a power that is beyond you, which I believe with all my heart is a divine power, namely God, you don't go any further. You don't have to go any further because you trust him completely. Aryeh Yitzchaki is one of Israel's military historians. Aryeh, I've been hearing all these incredible stories of how time after time Israelis find themselves locked in battle in situations in which, by logic, they should be defeated, and yet they emerge victorious. Some of the stories are a matter of luck. A real luck, and you need luck in a war. Some of the other stories are a matter of professionalism, but some of them I think 30% uh, of them are uh, real miracles. Give me a specific example. In the Sixth Day War, at the third night of the war, uh, a big uh, Egyptian uh, division was in the way to Egypt again. They were slow. The commander was uh, Major General Yakut. In the division, uh, there was uh, two infantry brigades two battalions of tanks and uh, some uh, 72 uh, artillery cannons. And on the road, there is one Israeli tank who stuck. And the commander of the tank was Lieutenant Ovadia Yoshua. So this one Israeli tank is all on its own? Yeah, yeah. He was alone. Then he saw the Egyptian convoy came from the east to west, to the Middle Pass. He began uh, to fire on them. At the first shot, he burned the tank, Egyptian tank, and, and the second, another one, and he began to fight with them. He fought alone all the night with them and stopped them. After five or six hours, uh, the commander of Vadia saw a general, Egyptian general, go through him with a white flag. And he came to him and they gave him uh, water, and the general uh, said to them, I am Major General Yakut, the chief of the Egyptian artillery and the commander of the division, and I want uh, to go with you to captivity, you know? I, I want to see the, uh, your commander, the, the chief of the brigade, the commander of the brigade. And Vadia said to him, there is no brigade. I am only one tank. You are lying. It's impossible. I fight with 30 or 40 Israeli tanks all over the night. And I told him, Dear General, I am alone, you can see, alone in the desert. But where are all the other tanks? They are go to the middle? No. And he don't believe him. And then uh, we take him to the camp prison in uh, Atlit. And I came after the war uh, to talk with the General. And I told him the story. And the General said to me, you are also lying like uh, Lieutenant Ovadia. Where is all the battalion of tanks? And he don't believe us. It was a real miracle. For many, the Six Day War in 1967 ultimately came down to the battle for Jerusalem. It is the most sacred place in Jewish history. The fight for its control was desperate and difficult. Once the war began to turn in favor of the Israelis, there was enormous international pressure not to attempt a capture of the old city of Jerusalem for fear of Muslim world retaliation. But Israel's history with this city could not go unheeded. There was more passion toward this conquest than any other battle line in the war. Israel had responded to an enemy bent on its destruction. One of those called upon to liberate Jerusalem became one of the war's greatest heroes. Yoram Zamush was a young paratrooper assigned to the capture of the Temple Mount. I met him in front of the western wall of the temple. Yoram, when you first heard that your unit was going to have the mission of breaking through into the old city of Jerusalem. How did you feel? Myself, maybe more than others, had a sense of longing for this city. To think we were about to finally fight in Jerusalem to liberate it. Remembering our parents, grandparents back in Auschwitz, this was the climax of their wishes. 
When we spoke among ourselves, we felt we were touching and even making history. It was not a very easy thing to get into the old city, was it? The Jordanians were waiting for us. We killed 80 of them during that first battle the night before we arrived ourselves inside the old city. It was a very difficult battle. We lost a third of our unit. There were more than 86 casualties. Hundreds were wounded. The city seemed deserted, but there was a danger of snipers everywhere. The way to the Wailing Wall was through the green door, which we found locked. An old Arab man suddenly stepped forward and, speaking in Hebrew, greeted us. He said he wanted peace in the holy city. For several minutes, we were at the Wall's courtyard, just a handful of us soldiers. Those first minutes were so quiet, no gunshots. We all prayed, even those of us who weren't great believers. We all wanted to be part of the Jewish people at that point. We were the messengers of the entire Jewish people throughout all generations. We haven't arrived at this point by accident. It was June 7, 1967. News of the liberation of Jerusalem spread like wildfire throughout the country. Tank commanders stopped to pray. Soldiers on the front lines cheered. The nation celebrated. Around the world, faithful Jews and Christians alike wept for joy at the news that 200 centuries of prayer had finally been answered. One man who came to see for himself had a very special reason to thank God for this victory. He had been here before, exactly 19 years before, on another night fighting another battle for this very same city. Ezra, 1948, yeah. you were a soldier in Israel's army fighting for independence. Right. What happened to you? We were told that we were going to liberate the old city. We felt flying. 
reaching the skies from excitement. It was a dark night, but through the dark, we could see the flashes of the blows of the bombs, and we could hear the voices of the explosions. And I saw that the bombs are blowing nearer and nearer to where we sat. I felt a strong hit in my head, push in my head, and the stream of blood flooded from the depths of my head. And all that time, I understood my right eye had been blinded. They took me to the surgery room and the operation lasted the whole day from morning to the evening. And they saw they made big holes in my skull to, to clean it from uh, all kinds of broken uh, bones. And later on I found that it was not only uh, bones, they had to take parts of the broken brain. I suddenly thought maybe that's the end. Maybe I was bordering between life and death. I suddenly trembled. And I felt I was facing God. I can't say how. It's above what I can say in words. I felt he was waiting for my prayer. No, I won't wait. let him wait. He has so many things to do in his world. So what shall I ask for? I wanted to live. So I said, God, my life is in your hands. You decide if I live. But if you're waiting for me to ask any, for anything, I would like so much to hear the word that Jerusalem has been liberated. שמעת את החדשות? בדיוק כשהחיילים שלנו עמדו לשחרר את העיר העתיקה, הכריזו על הפסקת אש. לא שחררו את העיר העתיקה? לא. אני לא יכול להגיד איך הרגשתי. הייתי עם הזמן, אני חייבתי מרגשתי. אני חייבתי להגיד, אני חייבתי להגיד, אני חייבתי להגיד, אבל אני חייבתי להגיד את האחר של העולם. Just as Solomon asked God not to bless himself, but for wisdom to benefit his people, Ezra's prayer was for Jerusalem. It seemed to go unanswered. What was it? For what did I break my head? For what our boys were killed? But maybe thanks to this prayer, after 19 years, came the Six Days War, and I got the news. Jerusalem to be liberated, the Temple Mount in our hands. How did you feel when you heard that? Did you remember the prayer that you had prayed back then, when, when 19 years later Jerusalem was finally liberated? I felt such a joy that, that it can't be parallel to anything. We are getting back! I felt I was, I caressed the skies from excitement. You still feel like it was your prayer that was answered? Not only mine. I'm sure there are more people who prayed for it. Why do I, as a Jew who doesn't believe, why do even I feel something stir in me when I stand here, 
and allow the presence of this place to touch me. Here among these stones is the heritage of our forefathers, the focus of our passions and our beliefs of what it spiritually means to be a Jew. Whether or not one believes, every Jew is committed to making certain that this place will never again be taken away from us. Not only because it's part of our history and our legacy as Jews, but also for the sake of Ezra Yechim, Yoram, and David, and every other brave soldier who fought and died here, so that those who believe can pray here, and that those who are still searching for their own miracle will be free to continue their search.